And when I was really little, I heard somebody talk about the river beneath the Missouri River. And I kind of wondered what that was all about. My imagination jumped to uh, an underground cave going down. Well, this is a picture of uh, one of the underground rivers in the Yucatan P Peninsula. Pat Higgins, my associate, has swam and kayaked through some of these underground rivers. Really a neat trip if you ever get down there. But that's not the um, river underneath the Missouri River. Really the river between the, beneath the Missouri River is the water that flows around sand and gravel particles that comprise the alluvium or the water deposited materials uh, in the Missouri River Valley. So the very small streams of water, if you will, flowing around all the particles is actually the river beneath the Missouri River. Let's start out looking at kind of the map of the floodplain. This is from uh, Brian Kelly's USGS report in the area. We see the width of the Missouri River Valley. In this area, a little less than four miles wide in the Kansas City area, two to two and a half miles wide, uh, much wider over in the Ray County area. And, and one little interesting thing to, to note about this, you see this little loop of the alluvium, the river alluvium coming down. And this is the Lake City area, Independence Lake City, Buckner area. And what happened is the glacier, last glacier came down and actually just formed this location. It was the southernmost extent of the glaciation. However, right in this area, the glacier came back a little bit and blocked the river and caused the river to spill over to the south and come back this way. Note also how narrow the river is compared to the floodplain. Now, we not only have are the Corps of Engineers to thank for, thank for making that narrower, but also we have much less reduced surface water flow since the time of the glaciers. So there's, comparatively speaking, smaller flows in the river now than at the time the glaciers were coming down. If we look at a cross section of the river valley, we have bedrock, big bedrock ditch or trough that's filled with sand and gravel. And down at the bottom will be boulders, cobbles, large, unbelievably large rock, grading up with, with finer sand, silt, and, and clays at the top. How did this get carved out of the bedrock? Imagine 10,000 years ago when the glaciers were coming down. In the wintertime, move down. In the summertime, they, there'd be a tremendous amount of meltwater. Tremendous, really, torrents of meltwater moving large boulders, gravel, just cutting out the bedrock. And then as the water receded, it would leave the boulders, the sand, and the silt and gravel at the top. This is a map from Brian's uh, Kelly study. The darker spots are the deepest part of the aquifer. And you can see right through here, the aquifer is really fairly deep. Uh, in some places, 120 to 150 feet deep. Most of it is in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 feet, but there's a deep hidden valley, deep buried valley that contains boulders, cobbles, it's extensive. Now, how much water is contained in the alluvium? The sand and gravel is deposit, water deposited materials is, is called the alluvium. So how much water is in it? If we drain at one cubic meter or one cubic volume of saturated aquifer, how much water would we get out? Or if it was dry, how much would we put in? So we have a little experiment here. I have one liter of dry sand. It's a, kind of a medium grade sand. And we have graduated cylinder. And I'll ask Janie to pour water in slowly and see how much, how much that takes until we completely saturate the sand. And right now we've added uh, 200 milliliters and it's still taking more water and that'll soak in. We've added 250 milliliters, which is 
25% of the volume of this sand. And it'll actually take a little bit more. So it's still dry. So if we look at a volume of saturated sand, we can get 15 to 30% of that is pore space filled with water. And we can drain that water out with wells to, for, for our use. How much water is in the alluvium itself? Well, the one cross section that we had, uh, the sands and gravel, let's just say is averaging 70 feet thick, in some places deeper, some places a little shallower, and a little less than four miles wide at this particular section. Now, if we take a length of the, the uh, river valley, in the river, say not, not one mile, not a half a mile, but if we have just a one foot thick slice of the alluvium across the complete valley, contained within that slice, one foot thick slice, is over two billion gallons of water. And that's enough to, for 12 families, to serve 12 families for one year. And that's just a one foot slice of the aquifer thickness all the way across the valley. So if we look in the Kansas City area for say a mile length of the river and the uh, valley, within the alluvium, there's about 15 times, 15 to 16 times more water in the alluvium than there is in the river. Granted, the water is flowing a little slower through the sand and gravel than in the river. In the river, we might talk about feet per second or miles per hour. In the, in the aquifer, we may be talking a foot per day, a little less, a little more, the speed or velocity of flow. Now let's get into the mechanics of what's going on just a little bit. When no runoff is contained, groundwater will flow toward the river. Water flows from higher elevations to lower elevations. So due to infiltration, rainfall infiltration, the water table has built in this area and the water will flow to the river. When there's no surface runoff, that's called base flow. The river is really just a drain for the aquifer. Looking at this diagram in another way, here again we have high water levels due to the infiltration. So water is moving from higher elevation to lower elevation. It's moving to the river and into the river. Again, the river is a drain for the aquifer. However, during floods, when the water levels are up, or due to excessive pumping and the water table's been lowered, the water will again move from higher elevation to lower elevation. It'll move from the river into the aquifer. So it can go either way. There's a connection between the aquifer and the river. Looking at a hydrograph, a chart of water level elevations with time, the black line is the stage or elevation of the river the black line goes way up. And he's, there's a difference in river elevation here of from this point, this high point to the low point, that's about a uh, 20 foot elevation, river elevation change. Now, as you see, we have this flood or high rise in the river level. Right in here, you can see the groundwater level. I'm sorry, these are monitoring wells installed in the alluvium some distance from the river varying distance, but as the river comes up, the levels in the monitoring wells will change also. And you can see the, the monitoring well level kicking up as the river goes up, and then as the river uh, recedes, flow is less, groundwater levels in the monitoring well follow the river. And so there's about a 10-foot difference between groundwater levels due to the change in the river level at this particular point. These are wells installed close to Boonville, between Boonville and Rocheport in the Missouri River alluvium. And back to our friend, again, the, the base flow diagram. Again, the uh, precipitation will fall, infiltrate to the water table, and then flow from higher elevation to lower elevation and recharge the river. Now, if we install a well and start pumping, and if the well's somewhat some distance from the river, or the quantity is not too high, 
what we're pumping out is 100% groundwater. It's water that's being intercepted on its way to the river. So we're removing some of that water, intercepting some of that water. If the well is close to the river or pumping large quantities of water, the gradient is reversed. And again, water's flowing from high elevations to low elevations and high elevation to low elevations. What we're doing is inducing water flow from the river through the riverbed to the well. It's called induced infiltration. Now this uh, characteristic is very useful because in the river we know there's, there's a lot of sediment, it's, it's dirty, a lot of silt, sand, there's pathogens, and sometimes there's some organic toxins. And by filtering through the riverbed, the sediment's removed, most of the pathogens are removed, and a good part of the uh, organic toxins can be removed as they attach to the clays and silts in the riverbed. And this is used ex uh, fairly extensively in Europe, especially Germany, along the Rhine and some of the other rivers that are heavily polluted. This is considered the first step of their treatment process. With all this magic of all this water underground, how, how do we get it out and how do we use it? We construct a well, and the basic schematic for a well in the alluvium, and we generally call these shallow wells, they may be 150 foot deep, as compared to deep wells that we have in, in the bedrock, say in the Ozarks, that might be 1,500 feet deep. So these are pretty shallow, but they can be very large capacity wells. And the general schematic is we drill a, a bore through the alluvium, through the aquifer, and then install a, a casing with a screen at the bottom to let the water in. And then we fill the annulus of the hole with a very select gravel to hold back or stabilize the aquifer materials while allowing the water to flow into the well. And then we seal the top of it with a grout to prevent contaminated surface water from moving down. Then after this is complete, they'll install a pump inside to pump the water out for, for our use. Now the way they used to drill wells, and they still do some wells this way, the old fashioned way is what they call direct rotary drilling. They pump water down through the drill steel, and then the drill bit will disturb the materials or cut the materials, and then the water will carry the sediment to the surface. Well, as the borehole gets bigger, we still have the same velocity of water coming down, but because of the much increased diameter of the bore, the uh, upward velocity gets very slow and won't carry the sediments. So they do things like thickening the fluid to allow the, the fluid to carry the sediments out. The problem with that is that thick mud that carries the sediments out gets into the formation and actually blocks the flow of water into the well. Some years ago, somebody developed a new method that's much more efficient called reverse rotary drilling, where the water flows down the annulus, the bit disturbs the, the material, and then the water's pumped at high velocity up through the drill steel, which can be six to eight inches in diameter. So large sediment can be carried up and, and out of the borehole with that. This is a setup for a well getting ready to be drilled. This is the mud pit, if you will. It continues, continues around this end. They'll fill this with water. The water will flow around through, here, through a pipe into the well bore. The drill pump and bit will bring the water up through here and discharge it back in here where all the sediment will drop out. And then the water can circulate back around. Uh, this is a picture of a well being drilled for Kansas City. It's kind of a messy operation, especially in the wintertime. In the wintertime, it gets chilly. Uh, this is a picture of a drill bit, a couple of drill bits. Uh, in the sediments, they just use something like this. It's pretty basic. Uh, they just disturb the sediments, the sand and gravel, and then it's sucked up this drill pipe. Now, when they get down into the cobbles or limestone uh, uh, boulders, They'll use this rotary type bit to break that up. This is a typical sample of sediments that we will catch uh, during the drilling process. 
and we'll run a size analysis on this material so that we can design the gravel pack to stabilize the bore. And there's a picture of some select gravel that's been sized specifically for that particular well. And then the, the well screen to hold the gravel pack. This is a sample of some of the gravel pack with its, how it relates to the screen size. Uh, a couple pictures of well screens. This is a 70 slot or, or 70 thousandths of an inch gap in well screen to allow the water in. Here they're getting ready to run the screen into the well. And you can tell some of these screens are fairly large. We've, we've installed 36 inch diameter screens for some of the Kansas City wells. They have to weld these strings together. There's, there may be 60 or 80 feet of well screen in each well. And for the reverse rotary drilling, you can't stop. If you stop, you have a chance of the hole collapsing and losing the hole. So it's a 24 hour day operation after it gets started. Here they're using a hopper to feed gravel pack into the well bore. And then when they're finished, this is one of the typical installations. This is for Kansas City, Missouri. They'll build, a, install a casing on a crow's nest for the motor, for the pump motor. And they'll size this for the expected, above the expected flood levels. Uh, they'll install the pump, which is down in the ground, the motor's up at the top, and then this charge is underground. This particular well goes about 140 feet deep, and it's atypical for the area. We can pump about 4,000 gallons a minute from this well. You think of your garden hose, running a garden hose, you may have be what, two or three gallons a minute, maybe. This is, this is rated at 4,000 gallons a minute, so that'd take a pretty big hose for that. There are numbers of cities in this area that use groundwater for their water supply. Independence, Parkville, Johnson County Water District, Kansas BPU, just numbers of cities that use groundwater for their water supply. This shows the location of the Kansas City well field, and that big well is located fairly close to the center of the valley in the really deep buried valley section. Their other wells are a little bit shallower, it only rated for about 1,000 gallons a minute. Kansas City has a surface water intake that they get most of their water from. And I, I believe the plant is rated for something like 300 million gallons a day in that, in that neighborhood. So why, do, why does Kansas City, with the surface intake, want wells? Well, they use a the groundwater, the alluvial groundwater, in a fairly unique manner. Don't remember their total groundwater supply. It may be 30 million gallons a day. I'm not quite sure. But they use it to solve several problems. Using river water, there are three significant problems. The temperature of the river ranges from the, in the summer from 80 degrees to winter to 32 degrees. That change in temperature is really causes some real significant problems. What first of them is that cold water takes a lot more chemical to treat. So when it's really cold, they have to spend a lot more money for treatment. Secondly, when it's freezing, the treatment basins freeze, causing operational problems. And then the biggie is our ancient water lines. The thermal differences cause thermal expansion in those old water lines. And when the water temperatures drop, we start having you know, water main breaks. So the city uses these wells to they'll pump warm groundwater out when the river water, when the river temperature gets down to a certain point, they'll pump warm groundwater to moderate that cold water temperature. Again, it's the induced infiltration. They'll start pumping the water out, the warm water out, but as they do that, cold water starts moving in. So if they turn the wells on too soon, or if it's a very long, cold winter, they could run out of warm water. And then in the summertime, they pump the cold water back out, drawing warm water in from the, from the river to resupply their bank deposit of thermal energy. Well, there's another type of well 
uh, that's been, become popular, and I've worked on quite a few in the region, called a horizontal collector well. And they're called horizontal collector wells because of the horizontal laterals that are projected out under the river and along the river. It consists of a concrete caisson that extends down to bedrock for a couple hundred feet, or a hundred feet or so. The laterals are then pushed out, and then after that's done, they build a pump house on top with the wells, pumps. We build a pump house on top and install pumps to pump the water out for our water supply. Uh, Construction is kind of interesting. They cast the cylinder, first cylinder, maybe about 12 foot high piece of cylinder. Then they use a clamshell and they just dig the sediment out from below it. And then it starts sinking under its own weight. When this gets down to ground level, they'll cast another section of concrete right on top and then clamshell out the metal and it'll just sink right on down. When they get to the bottom, they'll, they'll put a seal in the bottom and then they push the laterals out in sort of a unique way. This is a blank casing with kind of a digging head, what they call a digging head with holes in it in the front. And then they have a smaller diameter pipe coming in the middle. And the hydrostatic pressure pushes water at high velocity through these holes in front of the digging head. And so it's, ex it's moving the sediment, the high velocities carry the sediment with it into the caisson itself while big jacks push the lateral out. Here's a picture of that operation. The, the blank casing, the sand pipe, and then the jacks pushing that out. After that's out to about 200 feet, they'll install wall screen, just like this one, inside that blank casing, and then pull back the blank casing to expose the the screen to the sediments. They may have five or six of these laterals 200 feet long. That may be a thousand or maybe 1200 feet of screen with a lot of open area and a lot of water in. So there's a lot of water that can be developed with these collector wells versus a vertical well with maybe 50 feet of screen. So you can see there's quite a difference in, in the capacity of these wells. And then when it's finished, a pump house with pumps. We have several are in our area, these collector wells. This is Kansas City, Kansas, Board of Public Utilities. This well can pump over 40 million gallons a day. And it's rated as the largest capacity well in the world. Kansas is pretty lucky. They have the deepest, or the biggest hand dug well, and they have the biggest capacity well. DPU has since installed another one of these, fairly large, adjacent to it. Uh, this is over in the Parkville area. Johnson County Water District 1 has installed one of these. Olathe has five on the Kansas River. And we just installed one uh, for the uh, new IATAM power plant, Unit 2. Independence has one, rated at 10 million gallons a day. That's it. That was fast and furious, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.